Welcome uh, to the Portland District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers information session on the future of federal hydropower in the Willamette Valley system. Uh, I am Kelly Janes, a senior planner and public involvement specialist with the district. I'm being joined by Eric Peterson, our operations project manager, and we'll be presenting today on the Willamette Valley system federal hydropower operations. This information session includes the Corps' view and assessment of how the Willamette Valley system of dams are currently being operated, including specifically how the Corps' hydropower facilities are operated. Um, other agencies may have differing perspectives and ideas, and we will continue to coordinate with them. Um, but really, we wanted uh, to provide public folks with a, a better understanding of how this system functions currently. We will also be providing an overview of what Congress asked for in the Water Resource Development Act of 2022, also referred to tonight as WERDA 22, um, in regards to federal hydropower in the Willamette Basin. So that's the future of hydropower aspect of tonight's uh, proceedings. And although we will touch on some other efforts happening in the Willamette Valley, we will not be discussing them in great detail. And these include the Willamette Junction Injunction, the Willamette Valley Environmental Impact Statement, um, the Willamette Basin Review, or any of the other major U.S. Army Corps of Engineers efforts in the basin. If you have questions about these projects um, that you thought you might get answers to tonight and you don't get answers to them, you can always find information on these different efforts at their individual project website. And we'll um, post a link to a brochure that we've created that summarizes these major programmatic efforts and um, provides the websites for each. So, Carrie, if you could post that to the chat, that would be great. Um, so everyone can see it. You'll also notice that uh, the chat is going directly to our chat monitor, the host, Carrie Salon, uh, and this is intentional so that she can collect um, questions for the question session at the end of this presentation. So for tonight's agenda, like I said, the first half of the presentation will provide an overview of the cores and the, the Portland districts of the cores, Willamette Valley system of dams, the role of hydropower in that system, and the history of hydropower as it's changed over time. Um, so these are current operations that we are make, that we are focusing on. Uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, the draft environmental impact statement and what that might mean for hydropower. That is in draft form. It isn't final yet, and the final decision hasn't been made. But we know that folks on the phone likely are very familiar with this EIS and are wondering what kind of the synergies are with this effort here. And so we'll be covering that um, at a very high level. Uh, we'll also be talking about um, the Section 8220 of the Water Resource Development Act of 2022, WERDA 2022, or WERDA 22. Um, and basically, we'll just talk about what, what we were asked to study and um, provide a little bit of an overview of how it's different from the EIS. And then we'll talk about things that you can do. Um, one of the major purposes of these information sessions is to help create a good baseline understanding of how our system currently works um, to inform you so that you can make some public statements that will be attached to the report we provide to Congress. And I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. And then lastly, at the end, we will provide some time for questions. This will be a facilitated question session. All questions can be put in the chat at any time during the presentation, and they will go directly to our chat monitor. During the question session, the chat monitor will post questions received throughout the presentation so everyone can see them. We will only be, be able to answer some questions with pretty straightforward answers today. And I have a group of teammates on the phone that um, I'll offer the chance to raise their hand and answer if they feel comfortable doing that. But for complex technical or nuanced answers, we will take the questions back to our team and to provide written answers in a frequently asked questions section of our project website. 
Um, and so the URL to that was posted on the front slide, but I'll ask Carrie to post that right now so that you can cut and paste it and save it for later. Um, please check back to that website often as it will provide updates on this effort as well as, you know, the presentation of this recording, our presentation slides, as well as the frequently asked questions. Um, and those questions will include the questions and answers from yesterday's session that we had in the afternoon as well as today's session. In this way, everyone, whether or not they were able to attend a session, will be able to learn about the effort um, through your questions, as well as allow us to reach back to our subject matter experts and make sure that we're providing the most complete answers for you folks. Um, and so when the, if someone is gonna answer a question, I'll, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Um, we do have folks from the Bonneville Power Administration online today in listening mode only. There are partners in this, um, in some aspects, they're providing some uh, expertise into our assessment and anal analysis for our study. Um, and also, you know, they have great interest in hydropower in the Willamette Valley. And so they, we will also be asking them to provide some um, help answering some of the more technical questions related to their uh, scope of expertise. And I'll just repeat today's presentation represents the US Army Corps of Engineers perspectives on the function of hydropower and tower systems currently work. Um, BPA is providing some information for that analysis and will inform some of the answers to our questions. However, BPA has their own views for our commercial power and transmission marketing perspective that are not represented. So um, if you have technical questions like that in that realm, you are welcome to reach out to them. I will pass the baton over to my colleague, Mr. Eric Peterson now to provide us an overview of the Willamette Valley system. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, folks. I'm glad you could be here tonight. Uh, this slide represents a, a, a map of the Willamette Valley and the assets that we have in the valley, including dams, power plants, and fish hatcheries. You can see that our locations are principally on the tub tributaries heading into the main stem Willamette, and these facilities have multiple, often conflicting benefits. Our challenges principally are managing flood risks in the wet season here, in Western Oregon and managing conservation storage for multiple purposes in the summer months. Uh, we have 13 dams and reservoirs in the system, one on the west side of I-5, that's Fern Ridge, and then um, 12 on the east side. There are 10 separately congressionally authorized projects that include eight federal dams that we operate um, generation on and including three power peaking facilities and re-regulating dam pairs. There's one dam that was a flood control only dam for us, uh, Darina, that had uh, subsequently uh, FERC licensed private hydropower installed on it. And then we have four dams that provide flood risk management and other benefits, but not hydropower. Next slide, please. All right, um, here's a snapshot of the assets that we're talking about. Um, Fern Ridge Dam on the Long Tom was initiated in 1939, finished in 41. It's the oldest dam in the system and it's short, only 44 feet tall. Um, Earthville Dam with a concrete spillway. Um, Detroit Dam, uh, in contrast, is on the North Santee Am to the north. It's the tallest dam in the system at uh, 463 feet tall. It's a concrete dam. Cougar Dam on the Mackenzie is the next tallest. It's a little over 450 feet tall, um, and it is a rock fill dam with a concrete spillway. Um, we have three control centers for these 13 facilities. One is at Lookout Point Dam, another is at Foster, and the third is at Detroit. And it's important to note these are all different shapes and sizes, but they all fluctuate pretty significantly. Uh, because of our flood risk management mission, um, 11 of the 13 reservoirs, all the storage reservoirs, fluctuate a lot seasonally, up to about 170 feet for some of them. Um, and that's to allow us temporal storage in the winter months for uh, taking the peaks off of the inflows. Next slide, please. 
So most of our authorized purposes compete with one another. Um, our flood risk management mission demands that we pull reservoirs down in the fall, as we're doing right now. And when we do so, when we pull reservoirs down in the fall and refill um, in early spring and summer, that can be in conflict with recreation and other needs for water during the conservation season because there's no guarantee that we'll get steady spring precipitation to refill these reservoirs. We do the best we can to balance the needs and risks while sustaining mandates like managing flood risks in the wintertime and supporting water quality and fisheries benefits and irrigation benefits during the summer conservation season. Next slide, please. So these benefits are not insignificant. Um, our flood risk management benefit is, uh, is primary with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion a year, conservatively annually uh, uh, in flood damage prevention, flood risk prevention uh, of damages, protecting lives and property, transportation corridors, and, and really the welfare of people for about a population of about 3 million people in the Willamette. Our hydropower mission, uh, we were authorized by Congress to generate power at eight of these dams to be transmitted and marketed by BPA, except for some power needed to operate the projects to keep the, the lights on in the dams and power plants themselves. The amount of hydropower generated by the Corps at these facilities has changed over time, and been reduced after several species in the watershed were listed under the Endangered Species Act. First, in 2008, a Jeopardy biological opinion issued by uh, or BIOP issued by NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service, required the Corps to operate the dams differently to meet the needs of these species, namely spring chinook and winter steelhead. The BIOP also required construction of several expensive structures for fish passage and water quality management. Flow management and generation is now shaped to improve conditions for ESA-listed species, and more recently, a court-ordered injunction has added additional operational requirements for the species that further reduces the Corps' generation of hydropower in the Willamette Basin. I don't have the expertise to discuss the impacts to hydropower from BPA's perspective um, from these ESA requirements in detail. For this, you'll have to look to BPA. However, generally, these operational changes resulted in a reduction in actual power generation as well as diminished flexibility around the timing of our generation. Also, the shared costs to construct new fish and water quality facilities for ESA compliance have increased the costs both the core and BPA share to generate hydropower in this region. Navigation was one of the original authorized purposes for water stored in the reservoirs so that steamboats and paddle boats could travel up and down the river transporting supplies and people um, down in the lower part of the river. Although the upper river above Willamette Falls Locks is no longer utilized by commercial navigation, water released for navigation also improved water quality of the rivers during the summer, which could otherwise become stagnant, warm, and polluted. Uh, water quality, due to the water quality benefits from these releases, the Corps is still required by law to maintain seasonal minimum flows at Albany and Salem. Minimum flows are also critical on tributaries for ESA listed species. Um, during certain times of the year. Uh, the dams also are operated to meet temperature and total dissolved gas targets to maintain water quality. Um, about 82,000 acre feet of water stored in the reservoirs is used for irrigation contracts. A number of municipalities get their water supply from the Willamette River or its tributaries, including the state capital, Salem. And as the population of the valley grows and is expected to grow, there's also expected to be more demand for municipal and industrial water in the future, both um, in stream rights and, and storage in the reservoirs. Uh, over three and a half million visitors come to the Willamette Valley Project Reservoirs each year for boating and camping and recreating. Um, and, and that results in a lot of regional economic and national economic impact, estimated at somewhere in excess of $100 million in economic benefits annually. Um, not insignificant. And while not monetized or not easily monetized, the fish and wildlife benefits and environmental stewardship benefits for the system are, are, are pretty huge, um, including the many operations that we have to support ESA listed fish uh, and the, uh, the land and water resources that are above the reservoirs that we manage for uh, 
sustainability and environmental stewardship benefits. I want to say all of these purposes are really taken into consideration when making management decisions, but some purposes will take higher priority over others, depending on the time of year and other factors. Next slide, please. So this is a diagram reflecting our normal seasonal operations. Right now in the fall, we're drawing down reservoirs to create winter storage so we can capture high inflows during the flood season later in the winter, releasing stored water after storms pass and before the next storm arrives. We were created to buffer the impacts of atmospheric rivers that tend to come in the middle of winter. And as the risk of both frequency and amplitude of these storms progressively diminish in the spring, we gradually refill the system. And we kind of depend on steady um, or um, intermittent storms throughout the course of the late winter, spring, and even early, the early part of summer in order to refill the reservoirs to a, a full level at the beginning of the conservation season. And if nature cooperates, we're able to fill these reservoirs prior to summer where we use that conserved water over the course of the summer for recreation in the reservoirs and water quality, fish and wildlife and irrigation downstream. Next slide, please. A couple of notes here. Um, our key drivers, which I've already mentioned, are flood risk management and meeting the requirements of listed species. And the system really operates as a system. So if we affect one part of the system, we affect the whole system and we change the dynamics of it. We've modified operations in recent years, as I mentioned, that have not negatively impacted our flood risk, our flood risk management mission, but have supported downstream passage of juvenile spring chinook and winter steelhead, both listed species. Our conservation season operations support spawning and incubation flows in the tributaries and temperature management operations provoke biological responses at the right time of the year for fish seasonally. None of this happens by accident and it all involves trade-offs and affects how the whole system functions. Next slide, please. All right, note that the majority of the conservation pool, so this represents the, the, the conservation storage um, and, and maximum conservation pool means full storage. So it shows what is allocated in meeting the flows for fish and wildlife downstream for municipal and industrial supply and then agriculture and irrigation. Uh, downstream minimum flows are often dependent uh, releases on releases from the conservation pools to supplement natural flows through the dry months. Um, in June of this year, 56% of the flow at Salem was stored water. At that time, flows being released from the Willamette system was in, were entirely to maintain in-stream flow, not for irrigation or city and industrial water supply because we don't have contracts for municipalities yet, and it's really early in the season for irrigation. There's only a small amount of storage allocated to that uh, anyway. But this shows you um, what, the, what the total storage allocation is. Recreation is important to the economy. Um, uh, there's an awful lot of direct benefits at both Fern Ridge and Detroit. Um, and at, at those locations, it's, it's pretty high value, pretty important to those communities that are um, very dependent on recreation. So all of the trade-offs uh, come into play in terms of, of producing benefits for the system. Next slide, please. All right, this looks complicated. It's really simple when you break it down. The bottom axis is uh, months of the year. The vertical axis there is either elevation in a reservoir or um, the quantity of, of water stored. And the, the heavy red line that you see is our water control diagram or rule curve. Um, it's statutory for each of the reservoirs, meaning it's, it's, uh, it's embedded in law. And it, it represents um, our risk tolerance for flood risk management, which is based on a fair amount of science. Also shows the proportion of conservation storage that's allocated to fish and wildlife, to municipal and industrial supply and to irrigation. Uh, so uh, the, the light pink above, above the water control diagram represents our flood control storage, our temporal storage that we use to take the peaks off of the inflows in the winter months. The power pool below the conservation pool, below the water control diagram there, is really represents uh, storage that is available to our penstocks 
that we can use to generate power in those years where it may be really dry in the wintertime and there may be a heavy demand for power um, uh, throughout the system. And we have the ability to tap into that at some of our facilities. I believe this water control diagram reflects what's at Detroit. Uh, but we, we, we dip into that power storage occasionally when necessary um, in order to, to augment power on the grid. Um, and then proportionately you see also uh, the other the other conservation storage available. Below that, we have dead and inactive storage, which is a little bit of water remaining in the reservoir, but not accessible through our outlet structure. So uh, when we think about where we are right now, um, middle of September, uh, the water control diagram shows us moving down. Our rule curve is down. We're evacuating reservoirs. Um, as we get closer to the winter, we'll accelerate that evacuation and we'll pull down to the minimum conservation pool in December. We'll hold that low until February and uh, we'll get certainly get precipitation events during that time. Um, our storage will spike up. We'll pull that back down between the storms when the natural st stream flow attenuates downstream. Um, we'll use that capacity to evacuate that storage and reclaim it. And then beginning in February, we'll begin to gradually refill. And if every, everything cooperates, we'll, uh, we'll hit full pool in May and conserve, use that conserved water through the, the course of the summer season. Um, next slide, please. All right, here's a snapshot of all the core dams in the Willamette Valley again, um, and their authorities, um, the federal hydropower dams are shown in yellow and they include Detroit and Big Cliff on the North Sandy M. They include Green Peter and Foster on the South Sandy M and Cougar Dam uh, in the South Fork McKenzie River, as well as Hills Creek, Lookout Point, Dexter on the Middle Fork Willamette River. Um, Detroit, Green Peter, and Lookout are the power peaking dams, which means that when we go home in the evening and we turn our thermostats down in the summer or up in the winter and there's more demand on the grid, um, when we turn our TVs on or we're cooking on our stoves, um, we meet that demand by quickly uh, uh, shifting to generate from these peaking dams to meet the energy demand on the grid. Um, this can result in and does result in periodic high releases that are uh, could dramatically down, impact downstream flows, but our re-regulation dams downstream um, for these facilities, that's Big Cliff, that's Foster, and that's Dexter, um, really kind of balance that, allow us to, to store those peak flows, and then um, moderate the flows and keep them even and steady downstream because dramatic changes in flows on tributaries downstream impact the natural environment and fish, and we don't want to do that in a negative way. In this way, we're able to, to peak generate and, uh, and make, um, and the changes in flow rates downstream are really made gradually and gently uh, to, to safely not impact fish. All right, that's kind of a broad overview of the system and our authorities and what we do. And um, I'm gonna pass it back to Kelly to um, get more specific about uh, what we're evaluating in this study and what we're reporting on back to Congress. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Eric. So right now I'll give you some really high level basics on hydropower and, and how the dams, each dam kind of works at uh, a facility level. And this is, you know, a, our current operations. Um, so currently a hydropower dam or generally a hydropower dam typically has up to three types of outlets used to move water from the reservoir through the dam to the downstream reach river. These allow our operate operators to release water from various elevations in the reservoir, depending on where each is where each orifice or outlet is located vertically on the face of the dam. The highest outlet is the spillway, which is near the top of the dam and can only be used when the reservoir is very full. The penstock outlet is where the hydropower generation equipment is located, and this outlet is usually or typically located vertically in the middle of the dam or around the middle of the dam. And then finally, um, the lowest level outlets are typically reg called reg regulating outlets or ROs. Uh, and they're usually one or more of those low level outlets. Sometimes you have, 
you know, Detroit has, for instance, four of those. So they have kind of mid level ROs and low ROs. And then other dams just have low ROs. Um, and though how low they are depends on the dam. And then um, basically the hydropower dams design, construction, and operational configurations were originally made with hydropower outlets integrated in, as a primary means of passing flow through the dam. So they provide a source of power for the dam's operating equipment. Uh, so in excess of any marketable power that that can be used for powering the dam itself, using you know moving the gates up and down, um, that kind of thing. And so though these dams were configured, with, um, although hydropower was mainly for marketable purposes, the way the dams were designed, that Penstock outlet was designed as a primary outlet to be used um, for operations generally. When releasing flow through the Penstock outlet, the energy of the water moving from high head to low head or high in the reservoir to low um, downstream reaches, it, uh, that energy pushes turbines which generate the power. Again, I'm not a hydropower expert, I'm really making this as basic as possible. Um, so to get more information about this, you'll have to go to BPA or other experts, but generally this is how it works. The power is transmitted out to the grid through transmission lines. And for the Willamette Federal Hydropower Dams, the core is responsible for operating the hydropower dam itself to generate power. And the Bonneville Power Administration or BPA is responsible for marketing and transmitting that power generated. Um, as such, as our partners, they share the cost of operating and maintaining the hydropower dams, as well as um, sharing the costs associating with meeting our ESA or Endangered Species Act requirements, including the cost to construct and maintain any structures required for fish passage and water quality at our hydropower dams. So although the primary purpose of hydropower equipment is for marketable hydropower, because the Willamette hydropower dams were originally designed and constructed and operationally configured with hydropower outlets as a primary outlet, these outlets are integrated into how the core operates the dam for all purposes. As a result, the Penstock outlets and hydropower equipment currently provide benefits um, that are incidental to marketing hydropower beyond that. So these include uh, use for dam safety. So as the dams are located in remote areas where power goes out fairly regularly due to wildfire, fire, snowstorms, not to mention during a potentially large event like an earthquake, um, these dams ability to create hydropower also allow us to maintain um, power to the facility so that we can continue providing all the benefits of flood risk management and downstream flows um, when needed. Uh, so as like a redundant power source, basically. They're also critical for dam safety inspections. So because the dams were originally designed with this outlet as a primary outlet, um, the ROs or regulating outlets and stilling basins were designed so that they could be inspected maintained and even repaired um, by diverting all flow through the pen stocks and drying out those areas. So um, being able to use the pen stocks can be an important part of that maintenance. And then we also have, um, hoping this clicks works, uh, the gates of the hydropower facilities are important for flow management. So when you look at a, a regulating outlet or a um, spillway outlet, they have minimum gate openings, meaning that when you open them to the smallest amount, you have to open them to a minimum um, opening level. And this is often very large. Um, these gates are you know, in the tens of feet long or wide. And so that means a lot of water is released even at the lowest level. And this is for dam safety reasons. Um, if these gates are opened at a lesser degree than the minimum gate opens, for instance, they rattle or have other problems that could damage the gates. Um, whereas the gates on the turbines 
have a more refined flow and unfortunately my video is not working, but you can see here in this image on the right, this kind of wicket gate look um, in this silver area below the blue. And those can open very refined ways and being able to release smaller flows um, allows the core to fine tune outflows that meet downstream flow objectives while also preserving the water stored behind the dam. So we're not releasing a lot of water all at once for minimum gate flows at our um, spillways and ROs. We also have the ability to kind of meter it down using the turbines. And this extends the use of the reservoirs for recreation and ensures that there's plenty of stored water throughout the conservation season. Right. Hydropower operations also have incidental um, environmental benefits currently. Firstly, the penstock outlet aid in temperature management for meeting the temperature requirements for listed species. As the graphic shows, high head dams have deep reservoirs. The temperature stratifies in the, um, in the summer in the reservoir with warmer water rising to the surface and colder water sinking to the bottom. You may experience this when you're swimming where it's comfortable on the surface, but you dive down and it gets really cold pretty quickly. In the summer when downstream temps are warmest, naturally, we spill water, we can spill water um, at the surface using the spillway to maintain those temperatures for fish. Um, once the reservoir goes below the spillway, however, the pen stocks, by virtue of being located in the middle of the dam, allow us to continue to access warm water to mix with the cold water released from the regulating outlets below and maintain our targets or allow us to, you know, better meet our targets for fish. Um, hydropower operations also allow us to address total dissolved gas or TDG water quality issue. Um, TDG is the level of gases uh, like oxygen dissolved in the water column and high levels of TDG causes gas bubble disease in fish resulting in injury and even mortality. The spillways and regulating outlets actually have been shown to increase TDG, whereas the use of turbines actually degasses the flow and lowers TDG. This is demonstrated by the graph here on the left where TDG levels downstream of one of our hydropower dams is shown on the vertical axis and time is shown on the horizontal. The different colors indicate different years. And if you look at the pink here, you'll see a short spike in TDG that occurred when we had to shut the turbines off for transmission line maintenance. So this just demonstrates that turbines do reduce TDG levels. Um, and that's one of the ways that we use the pen stocks currently. And then finally, the pen stocks are important in some cases for upstream fish passage, where there are core adult fish facilities, uh, collection facilities directly downstream. Salmon migrating upstream to spawn are attracted to flow, so they're looking for waterfalls to go up to their spawning grounds. And we use this instinct by locating our adult collection facilities entrance ladders where the flow is typically highest next to our dams. Um, at our hydropower dams, this is typically near the penstock outlet where flow from the penstock enters the downstream reach. And if you don't release flow through the penstocks, fish may be attracted to flow coming from other outlets like the regulating outlets, as shown here at Cougar, where the regulating outlet is you know, downstream of the ladder entrance, meaning that fish are attracted um, away from where they would be normally collected and transported upstream to spawn. It's called false attraction. So that's how we currently operate our hydropower dams for um, not just marketable power, but other reasons. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, how hydropower has changed over time. I'll briefly discuss how hydropower reduction has evolved since the dams were built in the 60s. So as Eric said, the Corps was authorized by Congress to generate hydropower at these dams to be transmitted and marketed by EPA, except for some power needed to operate the projects. And the amount of hydropower generated by the Corps at these facilities has been reduced after several species in the watershed became listed under the Endangered Species Act. First, in 2008, with the Jeopardy of Biological Opinion issued by the National Marine Fisheries Service, which required the Corps to operate the dams differently to meet needs of those species. The BIOP also required the construction of several expensive structures for fish passage and water quality management. 
So flow management and generation uh, went from produce as much power as you can uh, to being shaped by uh, how we improve conditions for ESA listed species. More recently, a court ordered injunction, which Eric already mentioned, has added additional operational requirements for species that further reduces the core's generation of hydropower in the basement. And, you know, again, I don't have the expertise to discuss the hydropower uh, impacts to hydropower from ESA requirements in detail. For this, you will have to reach out to BPA. However, generally, these operational changes resulted in a reduction in generation and a reduction in generation flexibility, meaning that we, you know, have less flexibility about when we can generate. Additionally, the shared cost to construct new fish and water quality facilities for ESA compliance have increased the cost both to the core and BPA um, to share generated power in the, in the region. Looking to the future, I'm sure many of you are aware of the draft environmental impact statement for the continued operations and maintenance of the Willamette Valley system. This draft EIS proposes a preferred alternative that would include an estimated 1.3 to $2 billion investment to construct several large fish passage and water quality structures like the fish collection facility and temperature control tower proposed in the draft EIS at Detroit. I'll reiterate, this is not final, a decision has not been made, but this is just um, something that people are aware of and that could impact hydropower in the future. Um, the draft EIS preferred alternative also proposes operation, operational changes um, that would reduce generation compared to operations under the currently under the 2008 buy-off, though the reduction would likely be less than under what we're um, expecting for the injunction operations happening today. Uh, so looking forward, um, this how is this EIS work in conjunction with the Word of 22 congressionally directed hydropower study that I'm going to explain in a minute. Basically, they are parallel efforts, but they are separate. Uh, the purposes are different. The purpose of the EIS is to update operation and maintenance of our 13 multipurpose projects, the dams and reservoirs, as well as numerous revetments in accordance with authorized project purposes. So we did not look at deauthorization under this EIS of any purpose while still meeting the um, obligations under ESA to avoid jeopardizing the continued existence of the ESA listed species. So what you see here is actually the purpose statement in the EIS. Um, for the congressionally directed hydropower study, we were specifically asked to determine if there is a federal interest in deauthorizing hydropower at one or more of the dams. So is there an interest, would it be in the nation's benefit to deauthorize hydropower? at one or more dams. So what exactly did it say? It said within 18 months of WERDA 22 enactment, which was in December of 2022, provide a report to Congress uh, on whether or not there is a federal interest in deauthorization hydropower at one or more dams. In other words, do a study to determine if there would be a national benefit to deauthorizing hydropower at one or more federal dams in the basin. And we are, need to re provide a report to Congress by June of 2024. That's the 18 months from enactment. Um, so we are currently working on this study and it is an informational study to Congress. So no decisions will be made as a result of this, like in this study, um, like you would typically for uh, a feasibility study or something like that. There are no decisions. We're just trying to inform Congress. Um, and so that's kind of where you will come in. Um, but before I go into that, the study has, um, also, we've also been asked under word of 22 to include in the study, the identified vindication of effects of deauthorizing hydropower on the following, um, dam operations and dam safety of the dams that would be potentially deauthorizing hydropower at. So how, like, if deauthorization occurred, how would that change our operations? How would that uh, affect our dam safety at that dam? 
We also are asked to look at the effect to the other authorized purposes at the dam. So when we change operations, how would that affect flood control or flood risk management, water supply, etc.? And then because this system works as a system, you change one knob at one dam, it likely changes how you operate the other dams. How would uh, deauthorization affect the remaining dams within the system? And our ability to be in compliance with Endangered Species Act. And finally, how would deauthorization change the cost apportionments between BPA, the core, and, and between all of our authorized purposes. Also, we were asked to assess any structural operational changes that would be needed to balance um, the other authorized purposes. So, what does this mean for you? Well, first, today's session is to help inform you. We also have a project website that includes an overview of the border report background and process. And that downloadable project trifle that includes a summary for each of the major efforts happening in the system. And we are hosting these 2 sessions to help inform you about. You know, how our system currently works and what you know, the future looks like as far as this study. And the um, 1 of the purposes of this informational session and all of this information we're providing you is to help inform. Uh, providing your own spoken comments at a future listening session. So we will be holding one virtual and one in-person public meeting in the fall of 2023. So in the next few months, we haven't identified a date yet or a place, but please check back to our website often and we will announce it with um, some time in advance so folks can plan around it. Uh, and the purpose of this listening session is to solicit your remarks on Willamette Valley system hydropower deauthorization generally and the word of report and disposition study process. So we will basically be offering you the opportunity to come up and speak about your perspectives on these subjects. And those will be recorded and then transcribed verbatim as an, an attachment to the report to Congress. And the intent is to help inform Congress with the public's outlook as well as the results of our own study. All right, so now we will move into the questions portion of the proceedings. If you have not already, please post your questions to the chat. Our chat monitor will post questions individually, um, starting with the first we received. And I will read each of them aloud. Um, primarily for our visually impaired folks, um, but also for the recording. And then if there is a straightforward answer, then one of our, my teammates will raise their hand and I'll ask them to come off mic and, and provide that answer. However, um, you know, again, if there's a more complex technical or nuanced answer required, I'll defer the questions to written responses that we will provide in a frequently asked questions section of our project website. So again, Please look back to that website for more information. We will do our best to post the answers to all questions from tonight and yesterday's question session during um, in within two weeks, but certainly before the listening sessions. So, like I said, please check back often um, to learn more about the process. So, with that, I will look to you, Carrie, to post up the first question. All right, this is a long one, so bear with me. We are BPA's second largest customer, so this is from Roger Gray, CEO of PNGC Power. We understand that the study is deauthorization of the Willamette hydropower plants. Does this mean decommissioning or removing as well? Well, we have not finalized our view on deauthorization. We do not think decommissioning makes sense. These plants are not particularly economic based on the current authorization levels, especially after the planned costs being considered. My question is whether the core and government would consider possibly license, licensing alternatives similar to the current one plant that is under FERC license at Dorena. 
The Willamette hydropower plants do provide reliable carbon free power. We think an alternative of something like FERC license should be considered. Thank you. So I'll give a second to our teammates to volunteer. If I don't hear from you, then we'll defer an answer. And I do have one from Catherine Tackley. Please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and provide your answer. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, I'm off mute successfully. Um, good up, good evening. This is Catherine Tackley. I'm the technical lead of this project, and I work for the Corps of Engineers in Portland District. To answer the question, we'll be looking at several scenarios in the report to Congress, and these include partial deauthorization, meaning the turbines would provide station service power for the dams and ancillary facilities only, so no power would be marketed. The second scenario is full deauthorization and decommissioned pen stocks. And the third scenario being evaluated is full deauthorization with reconfigured pen stocks, meaning that we reconfigure the pen stocks um, to allow for the continued release of water through those outlets. And for clarity, we'll provide more of this information on the scenarios in the Q&A section on our website. That's a pretty quick run through of, of what we're looking at. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, next question, Carrie. Will we be able to historical power generation by month by dam? Concerned about BPA having the ability to reach the full valley needs for peak demand for heat and cooling in evenings. Um, I'll open it up to our car folks on the line. If anyone wants to volunteer to answer this one. <laughs> I have both Catherine and Eric Peterson. Um, Eric, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, just real quickly, our um, generation data historically is is pretty available. Um, if somebody wants that, they can contact uh, uh, our office and we can get it to them. Um, also, I know BPA has that those data as well. Um, if if you want to look back and see what we've done historically. Thank you. Here you can put up the next question. Some of the long-term studies I have reviewed by the Corps indicate possible changes to the precip precipitation patterns, more rain, less snow to simplify. What impacts, if any, yet are expected to rule curves for flood risk management? If changes are needed, what are the processes used by the Corps to modify operations? Any takers from our team online? All right, seeing none, um, this will be answered in the frequently asked questions in writing. Next question, please, Carrie. Will you accept written comments at the listening sessions? At this time, we're only planning to record uh, verbal comments. Um, but we will take this under consideration and we'll provide a written response in the frequently asked questions. Uh, and I'll just um, mention, because I haven't mentioned before, but our report to Congress doesn't require a public review and comment period as it's just an informational report to Congress. Um, so this, these listening sessions and information sessions are really in uh, addition to what we would normally do for a report to Congress, because we think it's important to provide information on the public perceptions or perspectives, not just perceptions, but perspectives uh, to help them make a decision. So that's why we're doing it. And um, we're still working out the lo logistics of what those listening sessions will look like. 
but um, hopefully we'll have a better response for our written responses and the frequently asked questions. Next question, Carrie. As a county commissioner, I'm concerned about peak power needs being covered by remaining BPA power generation sources. Would we see brownouts? Is there anyone on the line who would like to answer this question? Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can try to answer it. Uh, so I, I can't predict that there will be brownouts. Uh, I, I do know that we've had a uh, number of concerns raised about the um, uh, local uh, stability of uh, both transmission and distribution. If, uh, if we don't have generation or condensing uh, capability um, on the, in particular on the South Sandy M. And, uh, and that's a legitimate um, concern of people, and we have elevated that issue uh, to both the BPA transmission and generation folks, as well as the utilities that serve that area and uh, are making sure that we understand, you know, um, all of those dynamics. Uh, as our generation is being impacted right now, Green Peter, by a deep drawdown uh, to comply with the uh, injunctive order. So, um, certainly need more information on that and, and before uh, I think um, anything changes in a substantive way, um, we're going to understand that and uh, the folks responsible for transmission and generation uh, will ensure that uh, they're taking that into consideration in their operations. Thank you, Eric. Next question, Carrie. Will there be a draft report upon which to comment? Um, I can answer this question. So, as I said, uh, there is no requirement for a report to Congress to provide public review and comment. And to be quite honest, we do not have a lot of time to complete the, the, the draft or final report uh, with that 18 month timeline. So, no, we won't be providing a draft to the public for comment. All comments received will be based on what you learn here and your own and your own knowledge of the system. And whatever you learn from uh, other agencies. Anyone else want to add to that before I move to the next question? Go ahead, Eric. Safe to say that it will be a public doc publicly available document though, right? Uh, yes, I believe when reports go to Congress, they are, it's up to them whether they want to share it. Um, I don't know the exact procedures. Oh, I see, uh, Val, your hands up. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening, Kelly. Um, my name's Valerie Ringgold. I'm the chief of the planning branch for Portland District Army Corps of Engineers. Um, our process for transmittal of the report to Congress um, is that after the committees receive the report, then it can be made publicly available. So it's not made available until after receipt by Congress. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, next question, please. Is there a 2023-2024 plan to take lookout um, down to the RO to help with juvenile passage? What is the plan to continue juvenile passage? Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, a little bit out of scope of what we're talking about tonight, um, we are planning a deep drawdown of Lookout Point Reservoir to uh, to within 25 feet of the regulating outlet. Um, that is part of the injunction operation that we'll be carrying out this fall. Uh, as for operations at Dexter, while we have Lookout Point drawdown to elevation 750 feet, we will be spilling at Dexter. Um, so any fish that pass through Lookout Point will uh, have a 
a near surface outlet to pass through at Dexter Dam. Thank you, Catherine. We're lucky to have you on both projects, the injunction and this one. All right, uh, next question, Carrie. Ultimately, how is federal interest determined under Word of 22 if the core has one view and BPA has another view? Who submits the report? USACE, BPA, joint, or other? Anyone from our team like to answer this one? Uh, please go ahead, Valerie. So just generally, we are working uh, with BPA on this report to Congress. Um, the Congress actually directed the Secretary of the Army to transmit a report to Congress within 18 months um, from when word it was passed, which was December 2022. So 18 months is June of 2024. Um, and that uh, typically, on a civil works project, the secretary of the army defers the transmittal uh, responsibilities to the assistant secretary of the army for civil works office. So, most likely, this report will be not transmitted by the secretary of the army, but through the assistant secretary of the army for civil works. Uh, but it is uh, definitely the secretary of the army's um, was directed through Congress. Thank you, Valerie. Next question, Carrie. Deauthorization seems to narrow an examination of reducing hydro effects. For example, if the high head projects were permanently drawn down, a substantial modification of the power plant would be possible to replace or bifurcate the penstocks to drive a more fish friendly Kaplan style turbine. Is the Corps willing to consider changes in physical plant to make hydro less harmful? Would anyone on the line like to volunteer? Eric, please go ahead. Well, I'm wading into the deep water on this uh, on this answer, but it you know. We, we don't have opportunity for deep drawdowns at all our facilities while still retaining our uh, conservation storage in the summer months, um, which benefits, uh, has multiple benefits, um, as, as well as uh, at some facilities, um, deep drawdowns um, don't, for a protracted period of time, don't allow us to refill those reservoirs and may impact flood risk management. It, at this point, there's a whole lot of study that needs to go into really answering that question in a credible way. Um, that is my uh, uh, quick off the cuff um, solution. And Valerie has a thought that probably is a lot uh, more well informed than mine. Val? Get myself off of mute. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at the language in the word of authorization, um, so the word at 2022 uh, language, um, Kelly has the link there on this particular slide this up and take a look at that because Congress was very specific in what they asked us to look at. Um, and so it was, um, it, it was not, it did not include, say, retrofitting to a different kind of um, power generation. However, um, that is something that, you know, it could be a potential future study if, if that was a recommendation that maybe comes out of what Congress has asked us to do. Thank you both. All right, we only have a couple minutes left uh, in our session, so I'm going to take as many questions as I can in the next two minutes. Uh, but if we don't get to your question, we will answer it in the frequently asked questions section of the website. So please don't hesitate to add questions if they come to mind in the next one minute. But I will answer one additional question and then we will close out the proceedings. So, uh, Carrie, can you post up? Can 
In a scenario with deauthorized power producing dam, will there be any changes to the criteria for what determines the appropriate pool depth at any given time? Would any of our folks like to answer? Catherine, please go ahead. Yeah, so for the three scenarios, uh, we're, we are comparing the scenarios against what we're considering our baseline operations, which is um, operations that we're currently carrying out to so 2023 operations. Um, if Congress asks us, once we provide this report to Congress, if they ask us to take a deeper look into uh, deauthorization of hydropower at one or more dams in the Willamette Basin, then we could uh, at that point look at um, various reservoir operations um, that would include, you know, variable uh, or different reservoir elevations than we currently operate to. All right, thank you, Kate. Catherine. Uh, I would like to just thank you all for your time. We really appreciate, you know, coming on in an evening and, and um, listening to us and providing your questions. Uh, we really do hope that this was informative for you and we recommend, you know, checking back to our website for future opportunities uh, to learn and to provide your own perspective at those future listening sessions. So, with that, I will stop the recording and uh, close out the session. Thank you again. Good night.